discovery. Six trips to the lunar surface revealed much about our closest celestial neighbor and changed forever the way we view our own planet. Today, NASA is looking towards returning to the moon. A permanent lunar base would complement space station freedom and provide a springboard for manned missions to Mars. And if researchers at NASA's Center for the Commercial Development Space in Wisconsin are successful. The first lunar settlers will also be miners. Actually, this large automated vehicle would do most of the work, processing the moon's rocks and soil to remove a potentially valuable product, helium-3. Just 25 metric tons of this rare isotope, roughly the capacity of the shuttle cargo bay, could provide enough energy to generate all the electricity used in this country in an entire year. Helium-3 is produced by fusion reactions in the sun and carried through space by the solar wind. Earth's atmosphere shields us from the solar wind, but it has been depositing helium-3 on the moon for more than a billion years. Former Senator Jack Schmidt was part of the Apollo 17 mission, which marked our last, or as he likes to say, our most recent journey to the lunar surface. We can't always use fossil fuels for the production of electricity. Uh, there are uh, many environmental reasons why you don't want to do that. One of the most popular now, of course, is the addition of CO2 to the atmosphere. We don't need to panic, but we ought to be making those kinds of uh, research and development plans that we have an alternative to coal and other fossil fuels in the not too distant future. Studies indicate that the amount of radioactivity in a device like this generating energy from helium-3 will be one millionth less than in nuclear systems used today. And no greenhouse gases, acid rain, or solid wastes will result. The proposed mining system will be equally kind to the lunar environment. Once helium-3 has been boiled off, the untainted rocks and soil return to the surface, leaving it essentially unblemished. The process should also produce a number of byproducts, including water, which will be of great value to a lunar colony. And according to Jerry Kolsinski, a professor at the University of Wisconsin and member of the NASA commercial development team, current oil prices make helium-3 an even more attractive alternative. At today's prices, helium-3 would be worth $4 billion a ton, which would make a shuttle load worth about $100 billion. And that's enough, I think, for any businessman to figure out a way to make a profit. Helium-3 mining, using the moon's resources to meet future energy requirements on Earth. that regulates our temperature, weather, and importantly, what cleanses pollutants from the environment. We've begun to realize that our atmosphere has no geographical boundaries when it comes to pollution. Airborne industrial waste in one area can litter forests thousands of miles away with acid rain. Due to our everyday activities, a host of gases such as carbon dioxide and methane are being released into the atmosphere at alarming rates. These greenhouse gases are known to trap heat near the surface of the Earth that otherwise would radiate into space, potentially causing serious global warming. This problem has been studied by scientists for many years, but never with the detail an airborne observatory can make flying at all levels of the atmosphere. To do this, U.S. and Canadian scientists teamed up to study greenhouse gases in the remote northern latitudes of Canada. The program, called ABLE for Atmospheric Boundary Layer Experiment, is the third in a series of NASA-sponsored research expeditions. Initiated in the early 80s, ABLE will eventually study major ecosystems around the globe to better understand the dynamics of our atmosphere. 
With the help of McGill University, a ground-based site was chosen in northern Quebec that featured a forest and wetlands environment. Scientists from Harvard and the State University of New York built a 100-foot tower at the forest site to sample atmospheric chemistry and collect meteorological data. Meanwhile, NASA biospherics researcher Gary Whiting and assistant Joel Kinez spent countless hours at the nearby wetlands, measuring gases given off by these grass-like sedges. Detailed studies of the marsh plants were also made by a group from the University of Delaware to characterize their growth patterns and how they transport methane gas into the atmosphere. Because of their hollow stems, these plants are very efficient transporters of methane, piping the gas directly into the sky. Many other measurements, such as balloon songs, track local winds, temperatures, and humidity.